Welcome to this first lecture of Theory Construction and Statistical Modeling. My name is Dr. Kasper van Lissa. I'm an assistant professor of methods and statistics at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. My specialization is in predicting teenagers' emotional problems using machine learning methods. Aside from that, I'm the faculty ambassador of the Open Science Community Utrecht. And if you don't know what that is, you should find out and you should join us. And I spend a lot of time making complicated statistical methods more accessible to applied researchers. This course is all about how to take a verbal theory and translate it into a statistical model. It is roughly split up into three parts. The first part deals with theories of measurement. That is to say, how can we use statistical models to measure an unobserved construct? And the second part of the course is all about what we call path models. That means, how do we model causal relationships. That means how do we model potentially causal relationships between variables. And the third part of the course is about putting these two ideas together into a framework we call structural equation modeling. Now throughout this course we'll be using the free open source software package R. Why are we using R? Well one of the benefits of using R is that it is free. That also means that you can install it anywhere you want. You can even run it online. For example, if you're doing analyses on the train, every type of analysis that you can imagine is available in R. And that is mostly because a lot of people like myself are developing new methods in R first. So if you are an R user, you will have early access to the most advanced and convenient statistical methods. Moreover, as I already mentioned, I'm a faculty ambassador for the open science community. Open science is all about making your research reproducible. That means that you can show the steps by which you went from raw data to published results. Now, if your analysis is documented in syntax using R, you can demonstrate this process. Another benefit of using R is that it helps you generate beautiful graphics. This is a lot easier than some of the outdated graphics that are available in some other statistical packages. Now, learning R may at first seem a little challenging until you find out that there is a lot of support available from other R users around the world. And this support can be found on online forums such as Stack Exchange and R Bloggers. Finally, R can be flexibly extended, so it easily interfaces with other programs. For example, you can read your data files that were created in SPSS or in Excel or in Google Sheets. You can read them directly from your Google Drive, in fact. You can also output results to many different formats, which includes web pages. Maybe you've already seen an example of this because the course Gitbook that we are using was created in R. And you can also output some more familiar file types like Word documents or PDF files. Now, before we used R in this course, we were using SPSS and Amos. And there's a reason we switched. One reason is that these programs are expensive. Even if you get a subsidized student account, someone is paying the difference. So many universities and governments have deals with the publisher of these software packages that make up for the difference. Another challenge is that these programs are closed source. Every program contains bugs because people make mistakes. The problem of closed source software is that only a very limited set of people can check whether there are bugs. And an advantage of R is that the whole community can check for these kinds of bugs because you can just dive right into the source code of every analysis. A final limitation is that commercial software is very slow to develop new functionality. People typically only do this when it is commercially viable to do so. Whereas a lot of statistical researchers like myself are constantly developing new functionality in R. There's also relatively little demand for the commercial alternatives on the job market. Here is a graph from R for Stats, possibly a biased resource, but as you can see from this graph, R is one of the most highly sought after statistical programming languages on the job market. So even if you don't end up becoming a scientist after taking this course, you will still have learned a marketable job skill. Another challenge of working with commercial software was that the interface was so cumbersome that a large part of this course was just devoted to dealing with the interface, not talking about 
the statistical modeling itself. So we change that. Just to sum it up, what does R give you? First of all, for this course, you're going to have to learn some new software anyway. So why not learn something that will benefit you throughout your life in the future? Using R will save you time because you can automate many tasks by statistical programming. It also saves you money because it is free to download and install. It's a real life and job skill, so it can help you get jobs if you have R on your resume. It can also make your job easier because you can automate some of the repetitive tasks that you are performing. There's also a signaling advantage of using R, which is that people tend to take you more seriously, seriously, if you're using R as opposed to a point and click statistical program. And conducting analyses by programming them also helps you develop your logical reasoning skills. Of course, it's a little bit challenging to start learning any new program, but one advantage of using R is that it has a very high threshold. That is to say, you can do nearly any imaginable task with R. For example, the course documentation, the Gitbook, was written in R. Based on my prior experience teaching this course, I do have some words of advice for how to start learning R. The most important piece of advice is don't try to learn R. It's just too big. You can do anything in this programming language. Just focus on performing one task at a time. Copy paste code for each analysis and then adapt it so it works with your data set. So where do you copy paste from? You copy paste from the course manual, you copy paste from the previous exercise, you copy paste from the internet. Make small changes when necessary to get the code to work and always check that the result works as expected. In other words, you learn R as you go and you will increase your understanding step by step. It is very useful to use the help function in R. Every function has documentation that tells you how to use it. You can get this help by putting a question mark in front of the function name and then executing it, or in Windows, selecting the function name and pressing F1. And also Google how to do XYZ in R all the time. You will find a lot of help on forums like Stack Exchange and blogs like rbloggers.com. So here's an example. I literally Googled how to get a histogram in R and the first hit on Google shows me how to do that. It gives me information about the hist function and it even gives me a little box in which I can try to run this function myself. Going back to this idea that you can even run R online. With all of this out of the way, let's talk about the first content topic. What is a model? A model is a simplified description of observations. It's typically a mathematical description and it assists calculation and prediction. When modeling, it is important that your level of analysis is clearly defined. So at what level are you trying to describe the system? Every variable in your model should be clearly operationalized. So for example, if you say my model involves intelligence, you have to explain what kind of intelligence test you used to measure that. And you define all of the relationships between the variables. The paper by Small Dino explains this kind of explicit modeling in great detail. In this course, you will learn how to translate a verbal social scientific theory into a testable statistical model. You will learn how to analyze real data with these models, and you will learn how to interpret and communicate your results. There are two different types of analysis, and it is very important to clearly indicate which of these two approaches you are following. The first is confirmatory data analysis. That means you begin with a theory, you derive hypotheses from that theory, you collect data that could test the hypotheses, run a model and interpret the results, and then you're done. The second type of research is exploratory data analysis. In this case, you have your data first, and maybe you have a vague theory, but you're also going to analyze the data in different ways, look at the results, and change the model, or sometimes even the theory, based on what you find in the data. This type of data analysis is exploratory, and you have to be very careful not to interpret the results of exploratory data analysis as hypothesis tests. 
Throughout the course, I will re-emphasize the distinction between these two types of data analysis again and again. For now, it is sufficient to know that both types of analysis are equally valid, but it's very important that you communicate what kind of analysis you are doing at any point in time. In this course, we typically assume that you already have a data set that is ready to be analyzed. We make several real data examples available to you, and you are also invited to use your own data, if you collected any in previous courses, to conduct your assignments for this course. So one type of model is a statistical model. How can we define that? Well, a statistical model explicates our ideas about how our observed data were generated. That means we have observed variables with certain characteristics, and we develop a model to explain those characteristics. But what is a variable? Well, a variable is anything that can vary, so takes on different values between units of analysis. In the social sciences, our units of analysis are very often people, and people vary, for example, in their height, their age, intelligence, clinical diagnosis, life satisfaction, etc. All of those are examples of variables. But variables themselves also have characteristics. What are some characteristics of variables? Well, for example, they have descriptive statistics. We can describe the distribution of one continuous variable with a mean and a standard deviation, where the mean represents the average value of people, and the standard deviation can be interpreted as a measure of the average amount of variability around the mean. So how much do we expect people to deviate from the mean on average? If we have multiple variables, we can also describe how they relate to one another. And this we describe with a covariance, and if we standardize the covariance, so we lose its units of measurement, then we call it a correlation. And that is standardized on a scale from minus one, perfectly negative correlation, to plus one, perfectly positive correlation. So here's an example, a histogram of participants' ages. And you see that in this sample, the average age was about 40. We also see that the variance in this sample, that is the squared standard deviation, was 2, so on average we expect people to deviate the square root of 2 from the mean, which was 40. You also probably recognize that this histogram roughly follows a normal distribution. And a normal distribution is the simplest type of model that you can imagine. It is described just by the mean and the standard deviation. That's a simplified representation of the real observed distribution of these data. But in this specific example, it would be a really good model because the real data do look like a normal distribution. If we have two variables, for example, in this case, the age of both spouses in a couple, then we can also examine their covariance or correlation. The covariance represents to what degree the husband's age varies along with his wife's age. And the correlation standardizes that by dropping the units of measurement, in this case, years of age, and giving us a measure of association on a minus one to plus one scale. Now, let's use these data to make a statistical model. Let's say we observed, in this picture, that a husband's age and a wife's age tend to co-vary, so older husbands tend to have older wives. What kind of model could we fit to these observed data? Well, for example, we could theorize that a husband's age tends to determine his wife's age. We also assume that this relationship is linear. If we do that, then we can represent the association between these variables as a linear regression model. A linear regression model just estimates a diagonal line through all of your data points and describes them with an intercept, which is where it cuts the y-axis, and a slope which is how much the y variable goes up if you go up by one step on the x variable. You may remember this formula from previous statistics courses. This formula describes the linear regression model. We have an outcome variable, in this case wa sub i, which is the wife's age for every individual i. And we're saying that this is a function of b0, which is the intercept, how old is a wife 
of a husband who is zero years old, plus the slope B1 times the husband age for every individual husband sub i. Everything I've mentioned until now just describes the blue line. But as you observe in the picture, every orange point deviates a little bit from the blue line. Those deviations are called measurement error. So for every individual family sub i, we have a prediction error epsilon. If we add that term plus epsilon sub i, then we have a formula that describes all of the data in this picture. So what makes up a model like this? Well, models are made up of variables and parameters. Variables are something that we've measured and parameters are something we're trying to estimate. So the model you just looked at had two variables, husband's age and wife's age, and it had two parameters, namely the intercept and the slope. And then there was also a difference between the model implied value, which was the blue line, and the observed value, which were the orange points. And those differences are described by the prediction errors epsilon sub i. Now the parameters of a model are anything that we have to estimate. And in this case, that's the intercept and the regression slope. So if we look at this picture again, then the red line here indicates what the intercept B0 is. That is the point at which the blue regression line intersects the y-axis. And we also see what the green regression slope is, namely, if we increase husband's age by one year, how many years does the expected value of the wife's age increase? And now this epsilon sub i. Epsilon sub i describes the prediction errors, and we assume that these prediction errors are normally distributed around zero with a variance equal to the residual variance. The fact that these are centered around zero and added to the regression line basically means that we assume that all individual data are normally distributed around the regression line. And this residual variance can also be interpreted as the unexplained part of the variance. A teacher once told me that if I was only going to learn one model well, it should be the linear model, because you can use it for many different applications. We just saw how you can use it for linear regression. But it's also the technique that is at the heart of the next method that I want. But it's also the technique that's at the heart of the next model that I want to introduce to you. And this is the measurement model. I always like to explain it by referring to Plato's analogy of the cave. So there are people living in a cave and they are seeing a world created by the shadows of some ideal real objects that are held in front of a fire. In this analogy, the real object is the latent variable and the shadows that it casts on the cave wall are the observed variables that we use to infer its existence. Here's a colorful illustration of an application of a type of latent variable analysis. How do you make a picture of a black hole? A black hole absorbs all light. Pictures are typically made by absorbing light onto a receptive medium. So how can you take a picture of something that does not emit any light? Well, researchers from around the world work together to do it. So instead of capturing light emitted from these black holes, they captured some other indicators and they used those indicators to infer what the data generating mechanism must have been. So in this example, the black hole is a latent variable. If we assume its existence and we assume some type of relationship to indicators that we can observe, then we can estimate what the black hole must have looked like. The type of latent variable analysis that you are going to be learning is called factor analysis. Many theories in the social sciences relate to variables that cannot be directly observed. For example, depression, personality traits, or intelligence. Each of those constructs we measure with scales and questionnaires that tap into different indicators of someone's depression or someone's intelligence. So we have several observed variables that we're going to use to reconstruct an unobserved or latent variable. For example, if we administer an intelligence test and we assume that high scores on the test items reflect high levels of intelligence 
then we can reconstruct the values that people would have had on that unobserved variable intelligence. These types of variables are called latent variables or factors, and they are indicated by observed variables, which we can measure and which are in our data set. I've introduced you to two types of models. The first is linear regression, which we can also refer to as path analysis. The second one is the measurement model, which we can also refer to as factor analysis. Now, at some point in time, these two types of analyses were combined into a general framework called structural equation modeling. You can see a bit of the history of this development in the diagram here on the screen. So first, people discovered regression analysis, and at around the same time, factor analysis was developed. Then, about 15 years later, Wright discovered that you could chain multiple regression analyses together into what they called a path model. In the 60s, Euroscope discovered that you can combine path analysis with factor analysis into covariance structure modeling. And this has been continuously developed since then into ever more generalizable frameworks known as structural equation modeling. So we can define structural equation models as a general framework that encompasses many different types of linear models, including regression, ANOVA type models, and factor analysis in any combination. These models can be used to translate theories with many components into a statistical model. For example, theories that talk about the processes by which one variable causes another. In other words, mediation models or theories that say that an effect only exists for one group, but not for another group. In other words, theories that are about moderation. This technique is mainly used for confirmatory applications. That means you start with your theoretical model and then translate it into a statistical model. But you can also use it in exploratory ways, of which we will teach you some in this course. There's a graphical language for how to represent a structural equation model as a diagram. I call these things a box diagram. And I recommend that you look at the vignette on this website to look at these graphing conventions. In short, it is important that you know that observed variables are indicated by rectangles, latent variables are indicated by ovals or circles, regressions are represented by arrows with a single head, and these represent theoretically causal effects. Now, whether the effect is actually causal or not, that's a methodological or theoretical question. Arrows with either two heads or no heads typically represent covariances, and those mean that we know that there's a relationship between these variables, but we don't have a causal hypothesis about why there is such a relationship. And if that two-headed arrow goes out of one variable and into the same variable, then it represents a variance or a residual variance. So with these graphing conventions, we can, for example, represent a regression model as follows. On the left, we have an observed variable that represents how many hours someone studied for this course. On the right, we have another observed variable that represents the grade they got for the course. We hypothesize a causal relationship from hours studied to grade. So students who study more tend to have higher grades. So we draw a regression arrow there. Then the variable hour studied has a variance indicated by this two-headed arrow. And there's also the residuals of this regression. And those are represented by a latent variable epsilon, which has a residual variance and a fixed regression coefficient equal to one with which it is regressed on gray. So this box diagram is exactly the same as the formula below it. Grade for every individual, sub i, is equal to some regression slope, b sub 1, times our studied for every individual sub i, plus individual residuals, epsilon sub i. But we can also represent a multiple regression model. Here we have many predictors. All of those are correlated with each other and all of those have regression paths onto grade, and grade has some residual variance, which is represented by a latent variable, epsilon, which is centered around zero, 
and has a variance equal to the residual variance. Now here's an example of a path model. This basically consists of several regression equations chained together. So, for example, we have intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation both predicting achievement. Achievement is the outcome of those two, so it has a residual unexplained variance, epsilon. But achievement is also a predictor of grade, and grade in turn gets its own residual variance. And then there's another variable, gender, which predicts our studied, and our studied again predicts grade. So what we see in this path model are several covariances on the very left between intrinsic motivation and e extrinsic motivation and with gender. We also see regression coefficients. Those are the arrows with one head. And finally, we see residual variances. Those are the double-headed arrows on the absolutes. Here, the box diagram has been used to represent exploratory factor analysis. Maybe you've already done this for another course, and maybe this course will be the first time you try it out. What we have here are two unobserved latent variables, which we assume are correlated. Both of them have a variance which is fixed to be equal to 1 in order to make the model identified. We also have five indicators, in this case clinical indicators, withdrawn, somatization, anxiety, delinquency and aggression. And each of those latent variables is allowed to predict all of the five indicators. And what we're going to see is that some of the items have very high loadings on one of the latent variables and low loadings on the other, and other items have very high loadings on those remaining items. Just based on the face validity of those items, we may already have a theory about what kind of latent variables we can estimate here. For example, we may expect the first three items to represent internalizing behavior and the last two items externalizing behavior. So instead of estimating all loadings for all items onto both latent variables, we can also predetermine that the first three items are only allowed to load on an internalizing latent variable, we've given it this name, and the last two items are only allowed to load on this externalizing variable. If you put together the path analysis with this latent variable analysis, then you get a structural equation model. And here is an example of that. So this is different from factor analysis because we also see regression paths between the latent variables. So how do we interpret the parameters in such a model? First of all, any direct effects, which we can represent by the letter B, can be interpreted as regression coefficients. The interpretation is as follows. If the predictor x goes up with one point, then y is expected to go up with b points, controlling for all other predictors. We can also standardize these coefficients. Then we get a standardized regression coefficient, beta. This is interpreted as follows. If the predictor x goes up by one standard deviation, then the outcome y is expected to go up with b standard deviations, again controlling for all other predictors. Factor loadings are just regression coefficients, but they are regression coefficients from an unobserved factor onto an indicator. That means if the value of the latent variable goes up by one point, then the indicator is expected to go up, then the indicator is expected to go up by b points. And then we have covariances, which are unstandardized measures of association, and correlations, which are standardized by the variance of both involved variables. And finally, we have variances and residual variances. Like any analysis, a structural equation model comes with some assumptions. One is that we assume multivariate normality of the residuals of the outcome variable. This is at least the case with maximum likelihood estimation, but there are other solutions for categorical data that do not make this assumption, but we will not address that in this course. Another assumption is that all relationships are linear, unless we explicitly specify nonlinear relationships. Another assumption is that observations are independent. That basically means that every unit of analysis in our data set contributes unique information. 
if, for example, participants are members of the same family, then we can expect that they will be more similar to each other and more different from other families. So, not every family member is contributing completely unique information. We further assume that predictor variables are measured without measurement error, unless we represent them by a latent variable. And predictor variables are also called exogenous variables. That means that there are only arrows leaving them, there are no arrows entering them. And finally, as with any analysis, we assume that the model is correctly specified. And this is also important for the correct interpretation of the model. Even if you find a significant effect, if the model is not correctly specified, you might be interpreting garbage. So how does structural equation modeling work? Well, first they compute an observed covariance matrix on your raw data. That means that they compute the variances and the covariances of all your variables. Then they translate your model into an expected covariance matrix. So your model specifies ways in which the variables are related. Those can be converted to expected covariances. Now we have an expected and an observed covariance matrix and we compare the difference between the two. If our model is good, then the difference with the observed covariance matrix will be quite small. And if our model is bad, the difference with the observed covariance matrix will be large. To determine how small or big the difference between the observed and the model expected covariance matrix is, we calculate different fit indices. And we use these to determine if we have a good model or not. For example, if our model says that time spent studying predicts students' grades, but the observed covariance between these two is zero, then we have a bad model. This topic of model fit brings me to a very important point, explaining the concept of fit and complexity. Estimating a structural equation model is all about finding the right balance between a model that has adequate fit and only the necessary complexity, but it's not too complex. George Box famously said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. And Einstein said, the supreme goal of all theory is to make the irreducible basic elements as simple and few as possible without having to surrender the adequate representation of a single datum of experience. And Mencken said, for every complex question, there is a simple and wrong solution. Each of these quotes illustrates the art of balancing fit and complexity. As a scientist, we typically want a model that fits adequately well, so it describes the data well, but is not more complex than absolutely necessary. We want to find the simplest possible model that is still a reasonable description of the data. And model fit indices help us determine if this is the case. It is also important to keep Occam's razor in the back of your mind. And Occam's razor basically says, all other things being equal, you should prefer the simpler model. We've already looked at this example previously, and we described the orange data points with a linear regression line. Why don't we just draw a squiggly line that goes through all of these data points? That squiggly line describes the data points perfectly. Shouldn't we prefer that model which has perfect fit? And the answer is no, because the squiggly line makes very strange jumps in order to hit every data point. So if we sample just one more person, for example, who has an age of 45, we would probably make a very bad prediction for the outcome variable y, because the model is making these weird jumps. The model on the left, however, the linear regression model, will make reasonable predictions all along the x-axis. So in this case, we should prefer the simpler model on the left. The model on the right will also have very many parameters, in this case, polynomial parameters. The model on the left only has an intercept and a slope, the model on the right will have an intercept, a linear slope, a quadratic slope, a cubic slope, and so forth and so forth. Choosing between alternative statistical models requires you to balance fit and complexity. The fit describes how well the model describes the data, and complexity represents how many parameters are estimated in the model. So in this example, the first model has two parameters, and the second model has a great many parameters, maybe even as many parameters as observations. So, concretely speaking, how do we define fit? 
Like I mentioned, fit represents how well the model explains the data. If we do linear regression, then the data are individual values on the dependent variable. In that case, we can define fit in terms of the residual variance on the outcome variable. In structural equation modeling, however, we don't typically use individual participant data, but instead the data are the observed covariance matrix of your variables. We can summarize the relationships between a number of variables using a covariance matrix with an equal number of rows and columns to the number of variables. And then we see that for this example, the covariance matrix has three values. Variance of the husband's age, variance of the wife's age, and the covariance between them. The variance of these two variables represents the spread of each of them, and the covariance represents the association, which can be represented by a scatter plot. Note that we also have information about the means of these variables, but we're going to ignore mean values until week four. So if we want to estimate the regression model described in this box diagram, and we have this observed covariance matrix, then the regression equation specifies wife's age as a function of some slope times husband's age plus error variance epsilon sub i. Based on this formula, we can also derive an expected or model implied covariance matrix. The expected variance of husband's age does not change because it's an exogenous variable. The expected covariance of wife's age with husband's age is now represented by the slope b sub 1. And the expected variance of the wife's age is a sum of the model explained variance, namely the variance of y times that regression slope, plus the unexplained residual error variance, sigma square sub epsilon. In other words, we have split up the variance of wife's age into a part that is explained by husband's age and an unexplained or error part. Now let's define model complexity. We already know that the model explains the covariances between observed variables. And we also know that a good model should be simple, so it has the fewest possible parameters, but still offers a good description of the data, so it has good fit. If we have a model with more degrees of freedom, that model is simpler, which is desirable, but every simpler model fits the data worse than a more complex model. Now, this is the first time that I've introduced the term degrees of freedom. And to understand what degrees of freedom are, you must first know what the pieces of information are that we use in structural equation modeling. The data in structural equation modeling are the observed variances and covariances between our observed variables. Those are the pieces of information that we are analyzing. We can only ever estimate as many parameters as there are pieces of information. We estimate these parameters to describe the covariance matrix as well as possible. If we have more variables, then we have more covariances, so we can estimate bigger models. However, we can never estimate more parameters than we have unique pieces of information. So the upper limit on the number of parameters in a model is the number of unique pieces of information. The difference between the number of unique pieces of information and the number of parameters, that is the degrees of freedom. To get an intuitive understanding for what these degrees of freedom represent, try to solve the following two equations. If I tell you that 3 is equal to 5 minus a, it's easy to find the answer, namely a is equal to 2. But if I tell you that b is equal to 5 minus a, and I ask you what is a, it's impossible to solve, because there are infinite number of solutions to this question. Our models must be identified in order to be able to estimate them and an identified model has less or equal number of parameters to the number of observed variances and covariances. If we call the number of parameters Q and the number of observed variances and covariances P, then the degrees of freedom are P minus Q. So they are how many pieces of information do we have left over after we subtract all the parameters that we estimated. 
we can easily get the number of unique pieces of information by taking the number of variables multiplied by number of variables plus one divided by two. And that basically gives us the diagonal of a matrix, namely the variances, and the lower triangular of the matrix, namely all covariances. So in structural equation modeling, you're basically trying to find a balance between a perfectly fitting but very complex model and a very simple but poorly fitting model. On the two extremes, you have a model that specifies all variances and covariances between observed variables. It fits perfectly, and we call it the saturated model. This model does not simplify at all. And on the other end of the extreme, we have the simplest possible model, which just specifies the variances of all observed variables, but says that all relationships between them are equal to zero. And this is known as the independence model. And this one will fit very poorly. So if we translate these models to matrices, the matrix for the saturated model will be equal to the observed covariance matrix, as you can see in the top matrix. And the matrix for the independence model only has the variances on the diagonal. And all of the off-diagonal elements are fixed to zero. So we don't estimate them, we dictate that they must be equal to zero. Now let's say that we want to estimate a better model for students obtained grades in this course. And we have these predictors. Intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation, gender, achievement, time spent studying and grades. How many observed variances and covariances do we have here? Well, we have six observed variables, so six times seven divided by two gives us the number of unique elements on the diagonal and off diagonal of a matrix. So we have 21 unique pieces of information. Which of these two models is then simpler? How many parameters do you count in the bottom left versus in the top right? What are the parameters in this model? Well, each of the exogenous variables has its variance, so we have three variances. Then each of the endogenous variables, so the dependent variables, they have a residual or unexplained part of the variance. That's also three residual variances. Then we have three covariances between the predictors. We have five regression coefficients in total, which adds up to 14 parameters. So we had 21 unique pieces of information. We estimated 14 parameters and we are left with seven degrees of freedom. Now let's look at this model. The exogenous variables, or the predictors, each have their variance, so we have five variances. The outcome, or the endogenous variable, has one residual variance. The predictors co-vary, so we have ten covariances. And they all have an effect on the outcome variable, so we have five regression coefficients, which adds up to 21 parameters in total. So this model has zero degrees of freedom. So this is actually the simpler model. Like I said before, model fit is a statistic that helps us evaluate how well the model fits the data and whether we have a good balance between fit and complexity. You will learn more about model fit in the coming week. But as a broad indication, if the model fits the data well, then you can proceed to interpret the model parameters. This is suitable for confirmatory research. If the model does not fit the data well, then there are still ways to look at improving your model to make it fit the data better. But notice that that brings you within the realm of exploratory data analysis. So you can then no longer present those results as if they were a confirmatory hypothesis test. I will tell you about three model fit indices now, just to help you get started. The first is the chi-square test statistic. And this simply represents the amount of misfit between the observed and model implied covariance matrices. Your model has good fit if the chi-square statistic is not significant. And your model has bad fit if the chi-square statistic is significant. Because that means significant deviation between the model implied and the observed covariance matrices. However, with large samples, which we need for structural equation modeling, the chi-square statistic is very often significant. That's why we also look at other fit indices that control for sample size, like the RMSCA. Now with RMSCA, 
a value smaller than 0.05 indicates good fit and a value smaller than 0.08 indicates acceptable fit. Anything bigger indicates bad fit. We can also look at the CFI or the TLI and for both of these a value greater than 0.95 indicates good fit and a value greater than 0.9 indicates acceptable fit. But there are many other fit indices so you might want to check out for example David Kenny's website. I want to conclude today with a warning about model fit. Because we are representing covariance matrices, we are assuming that relationships between variables are always linear. Sometimes this is not the case. Data can look completely different but have the same covariance matrix. And this brings to mind Anscombe's quartet. In the top left is the ideal situation. We have a linear association between two variables. That association can be perfectly represented by a covariance statistic. But all of the other situations are misleading. In the top right, we have a quadratic relationship, which is not perfectly represented by the covariance. In the bottom left, we have a perfectly linear association with one outlier. And in the bottom right, we have basically a constant value for x with one outlier. And if we remove that outlier, there will be no association between x and y. However, if we calculate the covariance for each of these examples, we get the same values. So if we just fit a model to the covariance matrix, we will draw the wrong conclusions. One way to avoid making mistakes like these is to always plot the raw data. Plot the univariate distributions, plot the bivariate distributions. That's why it's so great that it's really easy to make good plots in R. And we'll do a lot of exercises with this in the tutorials. I've explained that data can look completely different but have the same covariance matrices. But it's also possible to estimate completely different models on the same covariance matrix and get the same fit. For example, the three models below all have identical fit, but they represent completely different causal assumptions. The first model assumes that the husband's age has a causal effect on his wife's age. The second model is more emancipated and it assumes that the wife's age has a causal influence on her husband's age. And the third model assumes that there is no causal relationship or maybe a bidirectional causal relationship and it just assumes that these two variables are associated without specifying a direction of causality. It is not possible to use statistics to decide which of these three is the correct model. For that we need theory or the experimental method. But in this course, we're talking mostly about theory. In other words, I want you to start thinking about your theory first and then think how to translate that into a statistical model. That was today's lecture. I'll see you again next week.